Welcome, everybody. So I'm uh, Wouter Den Haan. I'm a professor here at the LSE, and it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, this evening's speaker. Before I do so, there's a, a couple announcements. So the plan is that Camille will speak for roughly 40 minutes, after which there will be uh, some time for some Q&A. So uh, we could be done in an hour or so, though experience tells me it's hard to predict these, uh, these, these time uh, points. So please turn your mobile on silent. It's always a bit awkward if it happens, and it still happens now and then. Uh, for those of you who would like to Twitter, I think the hashtag is LSEECOM. This uh, event is being recorded, and if everything goes well, it will be made available on the LSE events webpage. And I think that's it for announcements. So today we're very happy to have uh, my colleague Camille Lander uh, speak to us. He got his PhD from the Paris School of Economics. And he's been a professor here at the LSE since 2012. His research focuses on uh, labor markets and not just the typical important stuff like unemployment benefits, but also more exciting stuff about labor markets for football players. He has uh, won already several awards. He has the Young Economist Award from the International Institute of Public Finance and the special award for best PhD dis dissertation from the French Economic Association. So even though he hasn't been an academic for that long, he already has two publications in uh, you know, our top five uh, set of journals. So we're actually you know, worried that he may leave us and at some point go to a you know, top school on the other side of the Atlantic. But this evening he's still with us. And so please join me in welcoming our speaker. Well, thanks a lot, uh, for this introduction. Uh, yeah, rest assured that uh, I'm, I'm not going to leave soon. I, I, I love the city, I love the LSE, and part of it is, uh, is really because of these type of evenings where we have the opportunity to uh, kind of, you know, speak to a broader audience about what we do uh, in, in real life. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my, my research. Um, the motivation is, is extremely simple. Uh, it's just that the world has changed tremendously, especially since uh, Wouter was born, 1908, something like that. Right? Uh, so you can see that something has changed in the way we organize ourselves in, in communities, in societies. The one big thing that happened is that we now share a lot of resources, something that you know, was not the case a century ago. And, and, and the best way to see that is to look at this figure where you see the evolution of the tax to GDP ratio. So what does it mean? It's, you know, just the amount of, of resources that we put together into a pot, into the government's pot, in order to fund some uh, expenditures and redistribution. When you look at what happened a century ago, well, pretty much no resources were put into that common pot at most like maybe 10%. And what did these resources fund? Well, essentially police, military expenditures, a little bit of infrastructure, that type of stuff. So not much was really shared. When you look at what happens today, well, in all developed countries, the, the key thing that really characterizes uh, the, the organization of these societies is that we share a lot of resources. We put at least 30% of the uh, income that we're creating, the resources that we're creating every year, we're putting that into a common pot. Uh, in some countries like Scandinavia, for instance, the share goes up to, to 50%. So it means that, yes, we're taking a lot of money out of what we are making every year. We put that into a big pot, and then we redistribute that. What is it, basically, that we're funding? Well, it's essentially the welfare state. So here is just like uh, one particular case, the case of the US, the evolution of the composition of these expenditures uh, over time. There is one particularity about the US is that they have a, a, a fair chunk of resources that is spent on military expenditures. If you were to look at the UK, France, or Germany, these expenditures would be much smaller. But the big picture thing is that you're going to find the exact same type of evolution over time in all developed countries, where over time we spend a lot more. I mean, the fraction of all these resources that we're sharing that we spend on the welfare state is greater and has uh, basically doubled or tripled in the past 40 or 50 years. 
you can see that here in the US in the 1960s, all these, what I'm gonna call the welfare state, which is gonna be essentially social security, unemployment and disability insurance, education, welfare, housing, health, uh, and health insurance expenditures, uh, basically that did not represent in the 60s more than a quarter of total expenditures. Today, it's almost in all developed countries more than 60%. Okay? So it really means that we have totally changed the model. We used to be living in societies where we didn't share that much and we didn't care that much about welfare policies. Today, it's totally the opposite. We have a big welfare state. And of course, with the big welfare states come some questions and also uh, some uh, broad feeling that we are also creating a lot of problems because of that welfare state. And you know, the best way to think about it is, I think, uh, that, that TV series, Benefit Street, on, uh, I don't even know, on, is it on BBC or whatever? I mean, th this is the epitome of the way people think about the failure of the welfare state. What is it that people kind of dislike about the expansion of the welfare state? What is, what is it that they accuse the welfare state of? Well, they routinely accuse the, uh, the, the rise of the welfare state to basically keep a lot of individuals out of work. Okay? So the idea is that, yeah, because we are now giving a lot of money to people when they are unemployed, when they are disabled, well, we are very much um, uh, discouraging these people to work, and that has a huge cost in terms of the total resources that we can create as a society. If it was just like keeping a little bit of people out of work, well, that, that, that shouldn't be too much of an issue. But the thing that people have in mind is that it's not just keeping a little bit of people out of work for one, two years, the time they get their unemployment benefits, it's that it's keeping them out of work for a very, very long time. There's this idea, I mean, when you look at Benefit Street, it's very much this idea that, well, now we've made welfare, being on welfare, it's some kind of a black hole that people get you know, absorbed into, and then it's an absorbing state, they never move away from it. And so it's gonna keep people in poverty traps, and instead of solving the problem of poverty, it's basically making the problem worse, because now people have no incentive to ever move out of poverty, because it you know, keeps them in a state that is you know, not that good, but not that bad either, and therefore they're making no effort to get out of it whatsoever. What are the ways in which these poverty traps are going to manifest themselves? They're going to manifest themselves in the fact that people are, because of you know, the welfare state, are going, to, are going to have very, very low incentives to invest in uh, human capital, so they are not going to make any effort to go to school and to perform well at school. Uh, but even more worrying, they are going to be living in what we tend to call uh, family welfare cultures, and Benefit Street is very much all about that. It's this idea that you know now these people, they live in a culture of their own, which is a culture of being on benefits, and the simple fact of you know being born in a family that is on welfare is going to make you feel like, yeah, it's totally okay to be on welfare. You are going to make no effort whatsoever to earn a living by yourself, and therefore you are going to stay on, on welfare forever, and that, that is one of the big concerns that, that, that people have. Of course, it's a pretty conservative concern that all of, of us have this concern, but it comes regularly in the, in the public debate as a very strong opinion that people have against the welfare state, and when they are aggressively uh, attacking the welfare state, that's usually the type of arguments that they are making. And that transforms into some kind of an idea that the welfare state has become some kind of a system by which we're having a, 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 a very divided uh, society with us and them. There are some people who get benefits, they get benefits forever, okay, and they don't do much in order to contribute to society. And then there are the hardworking families like you and I, we're working hard, I mean, not that hard, but sometimes a little bit harder. And uh, then everything that we're doing is just, you know, to fund uh, the living of these guys who don't make any effort. This, this idea that the, the society is very much divided into the people who benefit from uh, the welfare state and the people who contribute to the welfare state is very grounded in the public debate, especially these days, not in the, uh, in the US, but also in the UK, uh, where it's, it's, it's a common argument that is made. So today what I'm gonna do is, I'm not gonna debunk all of this, I'm gonna debunk a little bit of this, uh, and in particular, the one thing that I'm not gonna focus too much on, but I think it's a, it's a big issue, is this idea of us and them. 
For that, I, uh, I think the best way to, 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 to get a good idea of why this argument is so wrong is to read a book by uh, one of our colleagues here at the Social Policy Department. His name is John Hills. He uh, released a, a book uh, six months ago. It's called uh, Good Times and Bad Times. And basically, looking precisely at government expenditures, it shows that this idea that, well, you know, uh, there are some people who always contribute through taxes and some people who always get out of the welfare state, well, it's just false. It's not just right. Uh, why is it? Because when you look at, you know, the, 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 the resources that people get out of the welfare state and how much they contribute over their lifetime, well, it turns out that the state funds a lot, expenditures to the rich, and also the poor contribute a lot to the welfare state. Uh, uh, people contribute a lot because, well, whenever you buy a pack of cigarettes, whenever you go to the supermarket, you are paying VAT taxes. So everybody is contributing. That's not just true that nobody contributes or people at the bottom of the income distribution, they do not contribute. That is just false. The idea that people at the top end of the income distribution never get anything out of the welfare state is also completely wrong because you get, you know, a lot of uh, expenditures from, from the government out of, yeah, it's just, you know, putting your uh, kids at school, uh, getting childcare vouchers, or all that type of stuff. So when you look at the reality of the transfer that are operated by uh, the welfare state, it's just not true that some people are always contributing and some people are always getting uh, uh, things uh, out of the welfare state. But so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. What I want to do is kind of uh, look really at the, at the first arguments, all these things about, you know, uh, welfare state is extremely costly because it keeps people out of work and it might really keep them in a poverty trap, okay? So what is it that I'm going to do? Well, I'm going to try to uh, have a very simple approach. I'm going to just, you know, uh, explain what a welfare program is in, in practice, and then I'm going to try to show you how we economists, and again, uh, we're not the only one to have something to say about it, but I'm going to show you how me, as an economist, I think about the problems. I'm going to show you how we think about the optimal design of these programs, what are the costs of implementing these programs. So typically it's going to be, of course, that it's keeping these, these guys out of work, but there are benefits that come out of it. And so we're going to try to see how we can balance these costs and benefits and what recent research tells us about, about all this. Okay? So what are the type of welfare programs that I'm going to be talking about? Well, I'm going to talk about any type of welfare program uh, where basically you are redistributing either cash or also uh, in-kind benefits. So in-kind benefits can be, you know, housing benefits or just the fact of providing health care freely uh, for the people who contribute to the NHS. Uh, this is a, a typical in-kind transfer. So I'm going to talk about all these type of, of, of policies uh, the, the one thing that they all have in common is that there are going to be transfers that are made towards people that we deem in, in need. So what does it mean being in need? Well, it's, it's a complicated uh, thing to define. Here I'm going to you know, uh, focus on very simple dimensions. It's going to be essentially through the fact of having means-tested programs, so I'm going to try to redistribute towards people that I know have fewer resources than others. Okay? Resources can mean assets, income, uh, income ability. Uh, but also categorical programs towards people who are somehow deemed also in need, single mothers, the elderly, people with disabilities, and so on and so forth. Okay? So th these are the general type of programs that we can uh, think about as economists in a very simple uh, framework. What is this framework? Well, the basic trade-off that we have in mind is always the same for all these programs. The idea is that we want to put them in practice for a good reason. Why do we want to put them in practice? What, do we, what, 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 what are we trying to achieve when we put in place welfare programs? Well, we have this idea that people are in need, and therefore if we transfer money from somebody who is not in need to somebody who is in need, there is a benefit for society. Okay? Where do these gains stem from? Well, it's very easy. The way we see it as economists is that it somehow stems from the idea that the uh, utility, the marginal utility of consumption is kind of decreasing. So I think it's, it's best to see it with a, with a simple graph. What does that mean? The marginal utility of consumption is decreasing. Take a very simple example. I'm going to take somebody who's in the desert. He hasn't you know, uh, been drinking uh, water for like you know, 15 days. You give him a little sip of water, 
well, it's changing his life. He was like, you know, uh, uh, fighting for, for, for his life, you're giving a, a little bit of water, that one tiny unit of uh, water starting from a situation where I have no water whatsoever is increasing his utility, welfare, his well-being, whatever you call it, by a lot, okay? But now think about me. Tonight I've already, you know, drunk quite a bit of that water. You give me an extra sip, well, you know, it, you know, it gives me a little bit of benefits. I'm happy with it, but not as much as that guy in the desert, Okay? So what, 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 what this means, marginal utility uh, of consumption is decreasing, is just this. Then, if I have very few resources, you give me a tiny bit of resources, it makes me a lot happier. If I already have a lot, you give me one extra unit of resources or stuff or whatever, well, it doesn't make me as happy as the guy who has very little. In this context, of course, there is a benefit to society of taking a little bit away from the guy who already has a lot, to giving to the guy who doesn't have anything, okay? It just stems from that very simple idea. Of course, the amount of redistribution that we're gonna want is gonna depend a lot on the curvature of that, of, of that function, how much the marginal utility decreases, okay? But this is the basic idea. So that, that works uh, when we take money from one individual to give to another individual, but think about it as also being valid in the context of one individual over time, okay? What happens is that in our lives, there are many things that vary. Our income varies. We're exposed to many shocks, okay? And you can think of it as being two different uh, selves of yours. Uh, there are, might be a self of yours that is going to end up in a situation where it's going to have a lot of resources. You've won the lottery or whatever. Or maybe you're going to end up in a situation, one of yourself is going to end up in a situation with very low resources. You're hit by a disability. You're hit by a car. Okay? When you have diminishing marginal utility, even at the individual level, what that calls for is redistribution between your two selves over time or across states, and we call that insurance. It's the fact of when you are really in good shape where everything is, gonna, uh, is doing well, you're taking a little bit of money, you're saving it, okay, to give it to your other self when things go uh, wrong. Okay? So if I have decreasing marginal utility, I want to redistribute across individuals, and I might also very well want to insure people in case there are huge variation in their income abilities or income or resources over time, okay? So the idea of putting in place welfare programs is, is just this, okay? I mean, in the language of economists, it's mostly this. Of course, when you are not just an economist, but you're also interested in other social sciences, you might think, well, but there are many other things that are important about uh, about putting in, in, in place welfare programs. Economists don't think too much about this question, even though now it's kind of permeating a little bit more the field of economics, but I think these other potential gains, like potential higher trust levels, social cohesiveness, higher mobility, are important as well. Huh? A society where basically you don't redistribute at all, and bam, I'm hit by a car, well, you know, it's your problem, it's your fault, you can you know, work, you can you know, feed yourself. Yeah, I don't you know, give a damn, it's your problem. Well, of course, it's a society where I'm going to have low trust in each other, I'm going to have low social cohesiveness. Uh, it might be super complicated for my children, now that I've been hit by a car, to put them at school and to educate them, and therefore mobility is going to be hindered as well. So all these potential gains are, I think, uh, other dimensions that should be explored. I'm not going to talk that much about it, maybe just a, a little bit at the very end of this lecture, but these gains should not be minimized either, okay? So that's great. We, we know why we want to put in place welfare programs. The problem is that we cannot just redistribute all resources. Why? Well, because what we have is a problem of incentives. If I were to, you know, take all the money that you're making and say, well, you know, I'm going to give it away to somebody else, where well, you're going to say, well, this is the case, I'm not going to work at all. Huh? So we always have a problem whenever we're going to have uh, programs that, you know, take away to give to uh, other people. We're distorting the relative prices of working and not working. We're distorting incentives, and therefore we're distorting behaviors, and we have more lateral costs. Okay? <coughs> Fundamentally, where do these moral hazard costs come from? Well, they come from the fact that I cannot fully observe what people do or who people are. If I could, I wouldn't have moral hazard problems at all. Why is it? 
It's very simple. Think about the situation of the unemployed. The unemployed, okay, there are two reasons why they might not find a work. They might not find a job because uh, they are not putting any effort into finding a job, okay? But it might also be the case that, well, it's complicated to find a job. It's a market with frictions. You don't necessarily know whether uh, the, uh, the, the employers are right at this moment, right at that particular time, right at, part, at that particular place, are in need of your competences, of your abilities. Okay? So it might very well be the case that even though you're putting a lot of effort, okay, you're not finding a job. The problem for the government is that when I see somebody not finding a job, I cannot say whether it comes from the guy not searching at all or from the guy putting a lot of effort and not finding a job because there is no way he can find a job uh, no matter how much effort he's putting in. When this is the case, I have a problem. But if I could observe such effort, then that wouldn't be a, an issue. I would say, oh, man, you have worked like crazy, and because you've worked like crazy, you've tried to find a job, you've searched hard, I'm going to give you unemployment benefits. If, to the contrary, you are not putting any effort, I'm not going to give you benefits. So if, if we can make contracts of the welfare state depend on the search effort, we wouldn't have a problem at all. It's because we cannot observe search effort. It's because we cannot see what are the underlying causes of people not finding a job that we are having a problem. Because now, if I give benefits, people might, you know, have a reduced incentive to search, and I cannot say whether when I see them finding a job with, you know, higher difficulty, it's because they reduced their search effort like crazy or because the labor market has changed, okay? So the, the, the problem of asymmetric information is really at the heart of the cost of putting in place uh, welfare programs. Think about disability. It's exactly the same. Instead of being search effort, it's the type of disability that you have. I can you know, see somebody with a, a mental illness as somebody that is disabled and say, well, you cannot find a job because it's complicated for you. You have a, a mental illness. But at the same time, it could very well be the case that that guy is actually purely faking it. And he could work perfectly. If I were to know the type, if I, if I had the perfect information about what the type of the guy is, whether he's actually mentally ill or not, I wouldn't have any problem. I would only give disability insurance to the people who are actually healed and cannot work and cannot find a job. But I cannot do that because it's complicated to know the type. It's complicated to know whether people are faking it or not. Okay? So because of these asymmetries of information, we're always going to have a cost of putting in place these programs and people changing their behaviors and me not being totally able to control the search effort or the type of people to prevent people from benefiting from the programs, even though they are not really uh, uh, either uh, really in need of the program. Okay? So that's, that's the idea. So example of moral hazard uh, costs. In practice, it's easy to see them, and it's the reason why, in general, in the public debate, this is what people focus on. It's so easy to say, well, look, I've put in place a benefit program, and people have reduced their search effort, they are reduce their earnings, they are reduce their labor force participation. That is easy, we have the good data to look at this, and now for like 25 or 30 years, what most economists have been doing when they were talking about welfare programs was to document those moral hazard uh, costs. So now we have you know, a wide range of well-estimated uh, 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 identification of the effect of unemployment insurance on unemployment duration, for instance. We know that when you increase the generosity of unemployment insurance, people reduce their search effort and stay unemployed longer, okay? So this is typically a moral hazard cost. If I had a way to say, well, I'm only gonna give you these moral hazard, uh, these benefits if you, don't if you don't change your search effort, I wouldn't get into any trouble, but the thing is I can do so, and because of that, I increase the benefits and people reduce their search effort, they stay unemployed longer, this has a cost for society, okay? Uh, we have also many examples of well-identified measures of how uh, changing the tax system at the bottom of the income distribution affects labor force participation and earnings of people at the bottom of the income distribution. Okay? We also know that if you give more general health insurance, people are going to tend to overutilize health care. So all these type of things now we can estimate very precisely. The one thing that I want you to understand is that 
it's nice to be able to measure this cost well. And of course we can do so because we have the good data to do so. But the question is not so much whether we're going to find some costs of putting in place these programs, because of course, if we are you know, looking finely enough, we're always going to find people who are benefiting from the program by you know, just being lazy and so on and so forth. The question, therefore, is not so much whether there is a cost, because we know that there are going to be a cost. It's its magnitude. It's its magnitude that matters, because if the magnitude is large, it's going to greatly, uh, uh, um, it's going to greatly uh, diminish, decrease our ability to put in place redistributive programs. To the contrary, if this cost is low, then we shouldn't uh, worry too much about this. So the, the key point is really, in some sense, the, the cautionary tale is that any time, you know, you see in the papers people telling you, oh, look, uh, it seems like people are reacting to this type of, of, of policy, uh, of this type of welfare program, by changing their behaviors, the question you should have is not so much, yeah, is it possible? Because of course it's possible. Of course it's the case. The question is, what's the magnitude? And the magnitude is interesting because in most of these studies, you never find elasticities that are huge. You find elasticities that are sometimes large, okay, but rarely larger than 0.5. In other words, it means that if I, for instance, increase the generosity of unemployment insurance by 10%, okay, it's never going to increase the unemployment duration by more than 5%. Okay? So it's important because in many instances, there is some kind of a bound on the response that people are, are having to these type of programs. Okay? The other thing that I want you to keep in mind is that uh, in, in many contexts, even though people react it doesn't mean that all of this behavioral response is driven by something that is distortionary. Another way to say that is that if I give you more generous unemployment insurance, okay, well, you might react to this by saying, well, now it pays more to not search for a job and stay unemployed than to try to find actively a job. Therefore, I'm going to stay unemployed longer. But it could very well be the case that actually what's happening is that, oh, you were super liquidity constrained before, and therefore you were trying to get a job no matter what, even a crappy job, just in order to get you know, back in employment and get some money. Now I give you more generous unemployment insurance, well, you have a little bit of cushion to see things coming, and you're going to stay unemployed just a tiny bit longer in order to find a better match in the labor market. So uh, uh, another important cautionary tale about all these, these elasticities that you can see in the literature is that not all of the behavioral response is necessarily driven by something that is costly for, for society. Some of, of, of the response may be driven by liquidity or wealth effects, uh, and that's important to, to keep in mind. So now what I would like to, to address are the, the, the more problematic questions of the very long-term effects. All of these elasticities, all of these behavioral responses that I've just talked about, are essentially you know, uh, short-term responses to changes in the policy. Okay? So I change you know, right now the unemployment benefits. How does it affect the unemployment duration right now in the labor market? But I think what a lot of people have in mind is that, well, there is something more drastically dangerous about the welfare state and how big it has become. It's the fact that now people are really staying in welfare forever, that what we've changed is something like the culture. We are making welfare being something kind of cool and people are going to stay on welfare forever. So is that true and can we say something about <laughs> the impact of the welfare state on a so-called culture of dependency? The difficulty is that, of course, if I see somebody on welfare, some parents, and then 20 years later I see the kids on welfare as well. Does it necessarily mean that it's just because I've created some kind of you know, welfare culture? No, there are many things you know, that the parents are going to pass on their kids, but some things are not you know, a welfare culture. It's just the fact that you know, I've been living in that particular area. I got low access to education because it's, you know, not, uh, it's, it's a deprived area. I have low resources, so I didn't you know, have a lot of resources to invest into my kids, and so on and so forth. So it's not like, well, I'm just passing on a welfare culture. It's just that there are many things that co-determine over generations the probability of being on welfare. So what can we do in order to get really at the impact of putting some parents on welfare on the probability of the kids to be on welfare? 
Until recently, we had no evidence at all, but there is a, a recent pretty cool paper, even though it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a paper that you want to be extremely cautious about. Uh, so Dalkostel and Mokstad, uh, they looked in Norway, and the beauty of the, Norway, uh, of the Norwegian setting is that you can follow people in disability over a very, very long time because you have great administrative data. What they look at is the causal effect of having the parents put on DI, okay, on the probability of the children to be put on DI. But the problem is, of course, you don't want just to look at parents on DI. You want some kind of an exogenous shock of the probability of parents to be on DI so that the only thing that is going to change is that the people who are going to be on DI have received welfare, but they are otherwise equivalent to people who are not on DI. Okay? So that by doing so, you can fully control for all the other things that these poor families are living in that may affect their probability of being on DI. How do you do that? Well, what they do, which I think is kind of fun, is to use the variation in the leniency of judges in, uh, in Norway. What happens is that you apply to disability insurance, and then once you've applied, Sometimes you're rejected at first, and then there's going to be an appeal, and when there is an appeal, you go to a judge. These judges are extremely different in the probability of giving DI. Okay? So they are more or less lenient. The interesting thing is that your probability to be allocated to a given judge is totally random. Therefore, the idea is very simple. They are going to take parents. Some of them are going to be allocated to very lenient judges. Some other parents are going to be allocated to less lenient judges. What it means is that these you know, people should be roughly the same. It's just that eventually some parents are going to get DI. Some parents are not going to get DI. And after that, you want to look at the long-term impact on the kids and on their probability to be on DI themselves. What do they find? Well, when you look at the results, at first you're like, oh my God, I was shaken in my very progressive uh, beliefs when I, when I saw that paper. Uh, they find pretty uh, nice evidence of causality that parents on DI increases the odds of the kids on DI over the next five years by six per percentage points. So it's not, it's not huge, but it's still like, you know, a, a, a decent effect. The, prob the problem is that when you look really uh, at the paper, it doesn't look at all like the effect that they are getting at is uh, an effect through culture or whatever. Why is that? Because they find no effect on the probability of the kids to be on other welfare programs. It very much seems that what having your parents on DI does is that it gives you better information about the way the DI program works and therefore, if you have a disability yourself, you're going to be more able to set up your case and get the DI. Okay? So I think it's, it's a cautionary tale again that, yes, there might be things that happen when I shock the probability of somebody in your family or somebody uh, among your peers to have access to the welfare state. It might affect your probability to get into the welfare state. But these effects are not necessarily bad effects in terms of culture. A lot of these effects might just be good effects in terms of information. We're spreading information by having somebody now in my group having good information about how the welfare state works. And therefore, in some sense, this is exactly what we want. We have better information. We're going to have better take-up because we know that one of the key issues with a lot of the welfare programs is having low take-up. We're just increasing take-up through these type of effects. So that's, that's important to keep in mind. Other type of effects that we might worry about is the fact that having a very generous and redistributive welfare state might prevent people from being willing to invest in human capital, make it big when they, when, when they grow up, uh, try to you know, uh, be creative, uh, set up uh, businesses, and so on and so forth. The difficulty, again, is that it's, it's, it's hard to get at these effects. Okay? There is one very nice research agenda that has been set by uh, Hannah Brin Abraminski, a uh, former colleague of mine in Stanford, uh, and I really encourage you, if, if you have the chance, to buy his book. He uh, wrote a book, I think, a year ago uh, that speaks about all uh, what he's been doing uh, on a particular setting. What is this setting? It's the kibbutz. What is in interesting about the kibbutz is that it's, it's, it's a community where sharing rules are extremely strict and extremely redistributive. Okay? 
So these are, you know, a settlers community in, in Israel where basically resources are shared and uh, there is very little inequality in terms of uh, ex post uh, outcomes. What he looks at is uh, the effect of having some kibbutzim, because uh, over time some kibbutz uh, kind of change, uh, change their uh, sharing rules. Okay? So originally most kibbutz were very, very equal in the sharing of, of resources and outcomes, but some of the kibbutz kind of changed over time, and they made inequality kind of more okay in some sense. And what he looks at is the effect of shifting away from uh, strict equal sharing rules on the long-term uh, behavior of, of children at school and their human capital investment. Again, it's kind of interesting that he finds significant effects. So when you move away from equal sharing, students are three percentage point more likely to graduate. Uh, they are more likely to achieve a higher uh, matriculation certificate. Uh, they are, in general, doing better in exams, so there's a sense that, yeah, it's, it's their true human capital that, that increases. So, of course, when you look at that and you are, you know, very conservative, you might say, hey, this is it. Again, think about the magnitude. There is an effect, of course, and, you know, it's, it's kind of expected that, you know, if we look fine enough, we might find an effect. But the effect in magnitude is kind of small, okay? especially given that we are talking about strict sharing rule, and we are talking about communist communities where pretty much everything is fully shared with 100% hundred tax, uh, hundred tax on everything you do. Okay? So I think it's still interesting to see that even in this type of context, uh, the detrimental effects on human capital accumulation, even though they exist, are not that big. Okay? So, um, yeah, let's, let's, let's speed up a bit. I just you know, want to now spend two minutes on whether there is a way to actually just mitigate these moral hazard costs. Well, of course, the first way to mitigate these moral hazard costs is to get at what is the cause of these moral hazard costs. And as I said, it's the asymmetry of information. It's because we lack information about who people are or we lack information about what people do, about their actions. If we can get a, a better information, if we can do harsher monitoring, then of course, uh, we might reduce these moral hazard costs. And of course, a lot of welfare state programs have moved in that direction by making sanctions more, uh, uh, sanctions harsher on, on uh, unemployed who don't search actively for a job, all that type of stuff. So yes, there is a dimension by which, of course, if you enforce, if you better monitor, if you get better information about who people are and what people do, then of course you are going to somehow reduce the moral hazard cost. Okay? There is another thing that you can do tagging, but I don't want to talk too much about it. What I want to talk about, because I think it's, 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 it's a very pervasive idea in, 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 uh, in policy making, that, well, maybe the best way to get at the more or less hard cost is to put in place what we call ordeal mechanisms. So what are ordeal mechanisms? Well, I call it the slap in the face. It's very simple. It's, well, you want your benefit. If you want your benefit, you're going to take that slap in the face, huh? and if you're really willing to take that slap in the face, it's going to tell me that you're really wanting that benefit. Okay? So what's the idea? Again, the idea is that if people might masquerade themselves into being in need, but are not actually that much in need, okay? When I tell them, yeah, yeah, you want the benefits? Come, I'm going to slap you in the face. They're going to say, oh, well, you know, after all, I'm not you know, going to benefit that much from, from the program. It's okay. The people who are really in need are going to feel like, hey, yeah, well, yeah, I, I'm going to have to take that slap in the face. So, of course, it's, 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 it's pretty brutal in, in practice, but on top of that, it rests on assumptions if we really want to reduce moral hazard cost, that are kind of dubious in many, in many instances. What are these assumptions? Basically, the assumption is that what the ordering mechanisms is doing is I'm going to impose a cost on welfare recipients, by imposing a cost, of course, everybody is going to have a reduced incentive to, 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 to go into the program. But again, keep in mind that I just don't want to reduce the number of people who come into the program. I want that program to exist. What I want is to reduce the number of people that benefit from the program that are not that much in need and are reducing their effort or masquerading themselves into being in need because of the existence of the program. Therefore, the only reason why an ordinal mechanism is going to work 
in increasing efficiency, in doing a better targeting of the program, is only if the utility cost of the ordeal is greater for people who are not that much in need. Okay? So, of course, if you take, for instance, the standard ordeal mechanism, which is to have like a very crappy administration of the program so that anytime you want to get the benefits, you are going to wait in line for hours. Well, it sounds reasonable to think that this ordeal mechanism can increase efficiency. Why is it the case? Because if I'm a very able person, any minute that I spent not on the labor market, I have a huge opportunity cost of it because I'm a very able person. I could earn a lot of money out of it. If, to the contrary, I'm not so able and I'm, you know, disabled or whatever, that, of course, for me, the opportunity cost of time is low and, therefore, I might very well be willing to stand in that queue. That's one example. But think about now a situation where actually the people who are in need, uh, for instance, is disabled. He has a hip problem. For him, staying in line is extremely costly. Okay? But he's also a guy who would benefit a lot from the program. Therefore, what's going to happen is that because I put in place the hoarding mechanism, the guy with the hip problem is not going to be willing to stand in line and he's not going to benefit from the program. Who is going to benefit from the program? The guy, the young guy who is in good shape and you know, wouldn't benefit that much from the program. So what you see is that the underlying assumption for these organ mechanisms to work are very strong. It means that the people who would benefit the most for the program are also the people who have a utility cost of the organ that is the lowest. And in many instances, that might not be the case. So I think this is, this is important to keep in mind that organ mechanisms, even though you know, a lot of people feel like, yeah, it's, it's, it's the right way to deal with the moral hazard cost, in many instances, it's not going to be the case. Okay. So, you've seen for the past, like, what, uh, 30 minutes, I've been talking about the costs of these programs. Why is it that we never talk about the benefits of these programs? It's weird. Well, as I say, it's because we have great data on the costs. So, of course, we can, you know, show that, you know, people benefit a lot from these programs by not working, by shirking, and whatsoever. But when it comes to trying to say something about the benefits, suddenly, there is no economist left in the room. So what I want to show you is that, well, even though we have a critical lack of data, we are still working, some good people like me are working on trying to understand what is the true insurance values and redistributive values of these programs, okay? Of course, it's complicated because we don't have good data, for instance, on consumption, so we don't really know whether people actually are you know, really benefiting from being on the program by having a higher level of consumption and so on and so forth. But there are a lot of things when you look at the data that tell you that, you know, these programs, the expansion of the welfare state has had some benefits. The first thing, for instance, that is very, very striking when you look at the long run of history is the long run evolution of the elderly poverty rate and social security spending. This is in the US, for instance, but in any other country, you find the exact same stuff. Of course, it's pure time series correlation, so a lot of you might say, well, you know, maybe it's that, you know, over time, the uh, poverty rate of the elderly has just decreased. But when you look at these charts, it's, it's still pretty sh striking that, you know, before we put in place social security, the problem of poverty was very much a problem of the elderly. They were suddenly disabled, they couldn't work, and they had no resources whatsoever. They were extremely poor. More than 30% of them were living in poverty. You would spend social security by now giving benefits to these people who are retired, and you see the elderly poverty rate drop like crazy. Okay? Of course, there are many other things that might explain that the elderly over time you know, are less and less poor, but I think this striking correlation pattern should already tell us something about the potential benefits of these programs. Now, what can we do better? As I said, what we would like to do better is to have really good measures of consumption. The problem is that it's extremely costly to gather information on consumption. For quite some time, what economists have been doing is to try to conduct surveys that are extremely costly where you would take people okay, and tell them, OK, I want you to record every purchase, every expenditure that you're making in the next two weeks, for instance. But of course, you know, people would keep track of their records for maybe a week, and after that, they forget about it. And so consumption surveys have a lot of problems, a lot of issues. There is something that is changing now. We are having much better data. 
We are in the era of big data, and in particular, administrative data becomes available for everybody, okay? And from that, you can learn a lot, actually, about expenditure patterns of individuals. What I want to show you now is one way you can get at this. This is a paper that we're writing with some colleagues of mine here at the LSE. And the key thing that we're doing is that we're collecting a wealth of data in Sweden, and the beauty of it is that we have all the information about all the income and transfer and taxes that individuals are paying, but we also observe, and this is Scandinavia, we also observe all their asset levels, all their uh, real estate wealth, and from that we can back out the expenditure that they're making. What is consumption eventually? Consumption is all your income minus the change of your asset. If you do that, you can get at consumption for the entire population of Sweden, and in particular, you can then link that to great administrative data on labor market shocks, such as unemployment or disability, and look at what happens when people get hit by, their, by these type of shocks in terms of consumption. Here I've just plotted, and we're, again, keep in mind, talking about Scandinavia. That is a pretty generous welfare state, where people get a pretty generous amount of unemployment benefits. Even in this context, when you look at what happens when people lose their job, so here, people lose their job. This is the evolution of their consumption prior to becoming unemployed. It's stable, okay? And then, in the first year after becoming unemployed, they lose up to 25% of their consumption level, okay? So what that means is that, well, it turns out that people don't have that many means of smoothing consumption over time. They don't have that many liquid assets that they can use in order to make sure that their consumption is not going to drop when they are hit by a shock. Therefore, when you look at that, you start thinking, well, people might be much more hand-to-mouth than we tend to think, and therefore giving them benefits when they are hit by, their, by these type of shocks might be extremely beneficial. Of course, this is just the beginning of this type of research agenda, and over the next, I think, couple of years, we're going to learn a lot more about this type of consumption smoothing gains of welfare state programs, but this is just like some kind of a preview, just telling you guys that, yeah, you might be super disappointed about economists, but, you know, some of us are trying to, you know, uh, keep up the good faith, okay? At the same time, even if you were to show this type of graph that I've just showed you to a bunch of economists, a lot of them would say, well, but guys, of course, it's obvious. You know why these guys, you know, don't have any liquid asset, why, why, why they don't have any savings? It's because they know that they are living in a welfare state. So why would I save? Why would I save? I know that, you know, whatever happens to me, I'm going to be taken care of by the welfare state. So a lot of people are just saying, well, you know, it might very well be the case that the welfare state it's not doing that much of a good job in terms of smoothing consumption. The only thing that it's doing is crowding out the other means that people have to insure themselves, okay? And well, that's a claim that you hear a lot as well, and that might be partly true, of course. On paper, theoretically, yeah, it might very well be the case that, 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 that this is true. What can we do to try to say whether it's a very important problem or just some kind of a second-order problem? One good example of this is uh, from a recent paper by uh, Rachetti and, and some uh, co-authors in the context of Denmark. It's pretty much the same idea. It's that in uh, Denmark, when you're employed, you're going to be forced by the state to put into an employer pension system okay, part of your earnings. But employers are going to have different schemes, and therefore, the mandated amount of savings are going to change employer by employer. What they do is very simple. They look at people who change job, and therefore, they are going to put into systems where basically, in one, I'm going to be put in a system where my contributions are extremely large, and because of that, of course, in the future, I'm going to get high benefits. To the contrary, I can be put with a new employer, that new employer has a very low level of contributions, and you can think of it as being put in a welfare state that is not very generous, okay? When you do that, here is what happens, okay? So you follow people over time. At that point in time, they switch, and this is what happens to the total savings rate of people who switch to an employer that has a high contribution plan. If the crowding out theory 
was valid, what would happen? You tell me, oh, I'm going to force you to put more savings and I'm going to put into, uh, I, I'm going to put you into a more generous welfare state. Well, okay, I don't care. I'm going to save less on my other type of savings to undo that forced contribution that you're forcing me to make. If to the contrary, there is no crowding out, then it's just going to increase total savings of individuals. And it turns out that, well, it's almost always increasing total savings of individuals. People do not react a lot in their savings decision to changes in the generosity of the welfare state in some sense. Okay? This is what it tells us. So therefore, in this context, the whole claim about, well, you know, the welfare state is just diminishing people's incentives to save, and therefore, if I were to just remove the welfare state, people would just take care of themselves by, you know, other means, is just not what seems to be in the data. Okay? The other thing, is that, well, maybe it's not crowding out, you know, self-insurance, but it might be crowding out private charity. This is something that you hear a lot, especially in the UK after, I don't know if you remember, the big society speech by David Cameron. What was the idea of David Cameron? It's to say, well, you know, if we reduce the size of the welfare state, no worries, guys. You know, there are some private philanthropists that are going to take care of that, private charity is going to take over, and therefore we don't really need that welfare state in order to have, you know, uh, the, the, some transfer to the people in need. And indeed, when you talk to a lot of people, especially conservative people, there, it seems to be a very pervasive argument. And, and what they always tell you is that, oh, look, if you look at the U.S. compared to other developed countries, this is a place where the welfare state is very, very low. But we all know that the U.S. is also the place where the charitable sector is the largest in the world. Therefore, it means that the squatting out argument is valid. Well, again, it's so easy to debunk that argument. Think just about the sheer size of the uh, charitable sector in the U.S. compared to Scandinavia, for instance. If you look at the size of the charitable sector, the difference between the U.S. and Scandinavia is 2% of GDP. So yes, it's true the charitable sector is much larger in the U.S. by pretty much 2% of GDP. What is the difference in the uh, size of the welfare state? 10 to 15% of GDP. So it's not just true that the U.S. are just taking care of their poor by, you know, private means, where Scandinavia is taking it by public means. What this means is that the poor in the U.S. get much less transfer whatsoever, even though they get a tiny bit more private transfer than in Scandinavia. Okay? So that, I think, is extremely important when you actually do exercises to try to estimate precisely that crowding out effect of... Uh, the uh, welfare state on uh, uh, private charitable giving, basically you always get estimates that are significant. Yes, it's true, it has an effect, but that effect is very small. Okay? So I might you know, want to finish here. Uh, I realize that I already talked a lot more than what I wanted, and that Paris Saint-Germain is only going to play in, in 20 minutes. So uh, I just want to you know, say that this is, I, I try to present you in earnest the way we economists think about these, these, these issues. It turns out that it's, it's pretty simple, right? I mean, it's not that we've invented the wheel, right? But uh, the, the important thing is to keep in mind that there are many other dimensions that, you know, we kind of leave aside and that are important to, to think about. Things, of course, that are correlated with the size of the welfare state are trust, cohesiveness, social mobility. Social mobility is incredibly larger in Scandinavia, for instance, than in the US or, or, or the UK. Of course, it's just correlation. It may be driven by many other things that the welfare state, but it's not just because it's a correlation and we don't know whether it's causation, that it means that we shouldn't care about that correlation. That correlation is important. We need to understand it better. And I think this is also some type of research agenda for the future, a little bit at the intersection of economics and, uh, and, and other social sciences. And that's going, to be, that's going to be it for today. To ask you about, which really refers particularly to this country and um, only in the last, what is it, 10 to 15 years, is that the welfare benefits that are paid to individuals are largely paid to people in work. So you've largely been talking about welfare as an alternative to work, and I understand why, why you phrased it that way. But it, one, one way of, of um, putting this is that the, um, the Labour government <clears throat> brought in um, 
supports for, for people in very low income, and it, it helped a lot in reducing poverty, but um, at the cost of crowding out, as it were, um, the um, responsibility of, of employers. Let, let's collect a couple of questions. I think there was one in the middle. Hi. Um, you spoke about the difficulty in discerning um, someone's search effort for, for work and, um, and about ordeal mechanisms. The Conservatives this week announced that 18 to 21-year-olds who are unemployed will have to work for their benefits. And I wonder whether you see that as a way to discern their search effort or whether that's an ordeal mechanism and really what the difference between the two is. Just take one more. Right. right. Hi, sorry. I just had a small question about your method about getting consumption out of other forms of data. So if you're saying that um, consumption is the difference between your assets and your income, I, I got that right, it, is it a problem in terms of people who don't have assets? So is it too skewed towards middle and upper distribution? Mary Green, yeah. <clears throat> Thanks for, for uh, truly excellent questions. Um, it's true, I haven't talked about one of the, of the big change in the picture of the way we organize uh, welfare programs, uh, not only in the US or in, in the UK, but also in continental Europe, which is the move towards in-work benefits. This is something that really dates back to the late 80s, the expansion of EITC in the US and uh, in the UK, then in the 90s, the creation of the working family tax credit, and then in many other countries, you, you would see exactly the same. So of course, what this change is getting at is precisely the idea that there is a poverty trap, okay? People do not work because of the, those welfare programs. What we're gonna do is that we're gonna make work pay, and by doing so, basically, we're gonna mitigate the adverse effects of these welfare programs on total employment. It turns out that yes, uh, it's true that when you do so, you have positive effects on labor force participation, employment, okay? Uh, so now there are a bunch of studies that have, you know, looked at that pretty precisely and find that, yes, it's true that making basically work pay at the very bottom of the income distribution, where usually there would be huge implicit marginal tax rate before because we would take away all your benefit as soon as you started working, well, that, of course, has a huge impact on, uh, on, on, on employment. At the same time, now we are starting to see, and especially we've seen that during the Great Recession in the US and the, in the UK, that that switch that has been made has also a dramatic impact on the coverage of welfare programs. Of course, in the UK, the switch hasn't been that as great as in the US. In the US, we have to really think about like the, the overall of the welfare system in the 90s as being a, 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 a moment where, and it's under the Clinton administration, where we said, well, if you don't work, you don't get benefits at all, okay? And it turns out that, of course, it had a huge impact on uh, the poverty rates at the bottom of the income distribution of people who are truly disabled, who cannot work, and now are not getting any benefits at all, okay? So I think it's always some kind of a trade-off. You want to mitigate the adverse effects on employment, on, you know, the creation of resources of putting in these, these programs. At the same time, when you do so, you might reduce the coverage, and that has a cost in terms of redistribution as well. And what we're always trying to do is try to kind of think about this trade-off and find the right balance. Okay, so that, that would be my answer. Uh, the, the, the distinction between, you know, strict monitoring or the mechanism is always kind of difficult to make in practice. Huh? So, of course, when you're saying, oh, you're going to have to work in order to get your benefits, uh, or when you say, oh, I'm going to slap you in the face in order to get your benefits, well, you know, the... the, 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 the the border is sometimes, you know, uh, uh, difficult to, uh, to to find. So, of course, I think it's it's in between these two things, uh, and 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 I mean that's inevitable. Whenever you want to reduce the moral hazard cost, you are going to get into stuff where you're somehow making it more costly one way or the other through harder monitoring or through ordeals. You're just making it harder to get the benefit. Okay. Uh, then the consumption stuff. So, yeah, I've 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 been extremely quick on that. What is the idea? The idea is that 
what is your consumption? Well, any period you're getting some income, earnings, for instance, out of working. But you might also have some savings, some assets. Okay? So let's say I have a given stock of asset last period. Okay? And now I see that my stock of asset has decreased. What does that mean? It just means that I've taken away from these assets in order to fund my consumption. So consumption is, strictly speaking, the sum of your income plus not assets, but the change in asset over time. Okay? So, of course, what is extremely striking, especially when we looked at the Swedish data, is that 70% of the unemployed at the onset of unemployment don't have any liquid asset, but zero. I mean zero. So, of course, their ability to smooth consumption through their own means, through their savings, is zero as well. And therefore, there, there is, for these people, a huge... Uh, redistributive benefit of giving them unemployment insurance. At the same time, as I said, you might always say, well, but the reason why they are not saving is that they know that they are going to get benefits. As I said, I think that it's, it's a likely claim, but the effect of crowding out is not that big that uh, it prevents the unemployment insurance system from having large uh, uh, insurance and redistributive benefits. Great. Thanks. Okay, there's a question right there. <coughs> And, I th and after that, the two in the middle. Yeah, hi, my name is Anne-Marie Brady. I'm in the Department of Social Policy, and I work on active labor market policies in Germany. Um, <clears throat> I'm interested because in many ways this conversation is focused, at, focused on the individual who in the German case would be receiving unemployment benefit too, which is a short-term means-tested, not short-term, but a means-tested flat rate benefit. Is it working? Sorry. Um, and I think the general assumption, at least in my impression of this discussion, is that when we're talking about those individuals on benefits, we're talking about people at the very low end um, of the, of the uh, income distribution, and that those are those who are on means-tested flat rate benefits. But we also have something called unemployment insurance, um, where reform of welfare in the United States was just on one particular benefit, and that was TANF. Um, and in the in German contents, for example, you have unemployment benefit one, which is traditionally unemployment insurance. So there's still very much, in what I'm trying to say is what I'm trying to get at, is there's still very much a different perception, you could argue, about the, uh, those on unemployment insurance versus those on flat rate means-tested benefits and how much we need to motivate or provoke, the, provoke them to get back into work. Uh, in your analysis, do you look at those who are on the higher end of the income distribution who are receiving then traditionally unemployment insurance? And um, in the academic debates that economists are engaging in, do they have a discussion about these kind of typical problems looking at people in this other category of unemployment benefit? Yeah. So I have the question if there's any analysis or research that you've done that actually looks at, you know, conditional cash transfers, for example. So whether there's some sort of, like, you know, reciprocal incentive on the part of the welfare recipient. So if you look at the, you know, the program in Brazil, Bolsa Familia, they have to make sure that their kids are vaccinated, that their kids are in school before they get a cash transfer. So in other words, it's conditional. And that seems to be working, at least in rural Brazil. That actually kind of distinguishes between a welfare uh, a welfare case that's just simply a, a, a distribution of wealth like of cash, or one that actually has incentives or conditions involved with it. But there's a difference in terms of getting people out of a poverty trap. Just pass the microphone to the person for you. Hi. Um, when talking about welfare and social policy, Scandinavian countries often get mentioned um, in debates. Full disclosure, I'm by the way. Um, as a progressive economist who's trying to highlight um, some of the positive aspects of welfare rather than just the costs, is your idea of utopia a world where every country is like Scandinavia? And, <laughs> and, and if it is... You'd, you'd be surprised. How is that going to happen? And if not, why not? Sure. Uh, yeah. I'm going I'm to stop there uh, for, for this round. Uh, so... Again, uh, excellent questions. So uh, the, 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 the big thing that you're pointing out, I think, is the general distinction between what is pure insurance and what is pure redistribution. 
when you give a low flat benefit level for people who become unemployed, no matter how much they contributed to the system, it's essentially redistributing. You are telling these guys, okay, no matter what happens to you, even if you didn't contribute at all to the system, I'm going to give you some money because I know that you're really at the bottom of the income distribution, things really look uh, bad for you, and so on and so forth. Of course, what we're also having is a social insurance system where we're more thinking about social insurance, where it's more redistributing over time between different cells of yours, okay? So basically, I'm going to put aside some money today for my future pension, for instance, and that is what I call insurance, and that's still valuable because, of course, I know that when I'm going to be old, uh, I'm going to have less resources, and therefore, my marginal utility of consumption at that point is going to be high. So, of course, we're always, and I didn't kind of highlight that much the difference here in this talk, but, of course, we economists think a lot about this distinction about, okay, how much should we care about redistribution per se? How much should we care about uh, insurance per se? And, and, and in some sense, that, that, that also leads to the other question that you are asking, which is, okay, but so why do we do with people who are high earners, for instance? Uh, do we still want them in the unemployment insurance system, given that these guys have high earnings and maybe they can save for themselves, okay? So, of course, there is a dimension that you know, for people who are really at the top end of the income distribution, maybe the value of insurance for them is lower, and therefore we might not need so much to put in place social insurance programs for them because they are better savers, they make better decisions, they have more savings to begin with or more ability to save, and therefore, you know, that, that, that should speak about how we should design the uh, profile of social insurance as a function of earnings or earnings ability, okay? So, uh, other big question, so how much do we want to make social uh, uh, welfare programs conditional? So, it's, it's always a great idea. As I said, uh, any type of uh, mechanism that is an ordeal or somehow putting a cost, okay, on the fact of receiving benefits is going to affect people's behavior. If you think... Smartly enough, you might always put in place some cost of receiving the benefits that might end up being a benefit for society as a whole. Typically, oh, I'm going to only give you benefits if I see that your kid is at school, okay? So this is the uh, perfect example of, of Bolsa Familia in, 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 in Brazil. Uh, so, of course, you might always... Uh, uh, think about these things as being a way to get something out of, of, of conditionality. But it's not always the case that you're going to find some s such costs that can provide a benefit for society. In many instances, the only cost that you can impose is a pure ordeal that has just a cost for everybody and that is a net cost for society also. Okay? Uh, finally, Scandinavia. Uh, um, well, Scandinavia is fascinating, for sure. And it's also, for researchers, one of these places where, because you, you, you live in a society that is essentially transparent, uh, you collect a lot of data that is uh, put at the, uh, uh, that, that researchers can access. Uh, and so that makes it the perfect uh, playground for, for economists. So in the past, uh, let's say, 10 years, I think Scandinavia has been at the forefront of research in economics because of the availability of great and mean data. Okay? And that, I think, is great. Scandinavia is also fascinating for many other reasons, but now that I've been studying you know, Denmark, Norway, I've been doing all this paper in Sweden as well, well, it's, it's also... Uh, let's not say complicated places, but, I mean, schizophrenic sometimes. I mean, when you think about Sweden, Sweden is extremely uh, progressive in many instances, but extremely liberal. I mean, you have a voucher system for, for schooling. You have unemployment insurance in Sweden <coughs> that is not mandatory. It's, oh, you, you have a base unemployment benefits that is uh, uh, given to anybody, but otherwise, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's individual decision whether you want to join the unemployment insurance system or not. Uh, the pension system is also uh, basically individual accounts. Of course, notional accounts are not exactly individual accounts, but it is, you know, uh, a place where redistribution in terms of pension has decreased a lot in the past uh, 20 years. So there is a schizophrenia in, uh, in, 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 in Scandinavia that is really fascinating. And I think what is interesting is 
talking about the whole culture. I mean, the whole culture is, 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 is really towards uh, inclusion and redistribution, but you know, that doesn't prevent some pretty harsh uh, uh, integration problems to, 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 to emerge as well. I mean, I remember the big, uh, 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 um, uh, the, the, the big fights in, where was it, in Malmö in 2005 or something. I mean, it's, it, these are not perfect societies whatsoever, so it's, it's super important, I think, to look at them. But uh, it, it was funny. I mean, this afternoon I was looking at a, a, a TV program from 1969 in France where the prime minister, Mr. Chabandelmas at the time, was saying, oh, you know, we should look at, at Sweden. Sweden is perfect. Uh, they have great labor market relationships. Uh, they don't have that many uh, strikes and stuff like that. It's, it's the perfect place. Well, yeah, it's true. It's been 30 years that we all say, well, Scandinavia is fabulous. It turns out that Scandinavia itself has been, you know, up and down during these 30 years. In 1991, you would ask Swedish people whether they saw it was a great place. They were all saying, well, no, we're really, really downhill right now. So what I'm saying is that, yeah, we're all trying to emulate one another, uh, and all countries should benefit a lot from looking at each other. I, I don't believe that we can just replicate the Scandinavian culture uh, 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 elsewhere. It's, it's a big system with its benefits and its flaws, uh, but, but that's what you know, studying economics and social science is all about. One more round. <coughs> On the side, <coughs> first. Okay. This guy. Okay. Um, do you think that tax credits have had the effect of reducing the wages of the low paid? Because it occurs to me that it encourages employers to offer very low wages, safe in the knowledge that um, many of their employees will be able to get their wages topped up by tax credits. And then in the front, and then final question over there. On one of the slides, you showed a graph where um, the, the pension contributions of the employer versus individual where the employer benefit went from low to high. I'm wondering if that paper showed the opposite, where the employer benefit went from high to low, or if not, if you can offer some comment on what effect you think that have on individual contributions. Um, in Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century, um, he suggests global wealth and inheritance taxes to tackle wealth inequality. Um, if these taxes were put into place, how would this change the way the welfare state functions? Okay, um, <clears throat> so the, the question you're asking is, is, a, is, is a question uh, that has fascinated economists for quite some time. It's what we call incidence problems. Uh, when I put in place uh, tax credit or when I put in place housing benefits, for instance, who pockets the benefits? Uh, the traditional question, for instance, is in the context of housing benefits. You say, oh, you're going to get benefits uh, for your housing. Well, if you do that, people are going to demand more housing, and because of that, prices of housing are going to go up, and eventually the benefits are pocketed by uh, landlords rather than, than renters. Huh? Uh, in the context of low-income people, it's the same thing. You tell people, oh, if you work more, you're going to get tax credits. Well, people increase their labor supply. If uh, labor demand is somehow downward sloping, then the prices of labor is going to go down. And therefore, who pockets the benefits? Again, partially the employers through lower wages. Difficulty is that estimating these general equilibrium effects okay, that you know, uh, arise in the labor market or in the housing market are extremely complicated. So we have very little evidence. The best evidence that we have is a paper by Jesse Rochstein, and I think what he finds is what everybody has somehow in mind, that yes, it has to have an effect, okay? Of course, the effect is always going to be proportional to the amount of increase in labor supply of the people at the bottom of the income distribution to begin with. Huh? You need the program to have an effect on labor supply so that in equilibrium, wages go down. It turns out that these programs have a relatively high effect on labor supply, so we expect indeed their wages to somehow go down at some point. It's true that what he finds is exactly this, that in the short run, the wages of the uh, people who benefit from the uh, uh, earned income tax credit have gone down. 
What we believe, though, we economists in general, is that in the very, very long run, all these effects that arise essentially from the fact that labor demand is somehow downward sloping are not really valid in the long run when, you know, in the long run we believe that labor demand should somehow be very elastic. What does that mean? That means that in the very, very short term, it's very complicated for me when I see a lot more people coming in to say, well, I'm going to also increase the number of computers in my firm. Therefore, I'm going to have more people in my firm, but fewer computers per worker. The productivity goes down of these workers, and therefore their wages should go down. But in the long run, of course, I can bring more computers to the firm, and therefore there is no reason to expect that the productivity of these workers is going to go down in the long run. When you look, for instance, and I think it's pretty interesting, at the very, very long run evolution of the share of the value added in the economy that goes to the workers. What is fascinating is that, well, it has declined actually in recent years, but is, it's fairly stable over the past 60 years. Even though over the past 60 years, what has happened is that contribution benefits have increased like crazy. So there is a sense that in the very, very long run, the effects of these welfare benefits, these welfare programs on wages is somehow limited. But again, it doesn't mean that in the short run, where, you know, we're not dead yet, uh, all these questions might not matter, okay? Uh, so then we have the question about, so I missed the second one. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, the fact of having uh, people, instead of moving from a, a low contribution employer to a high contribution employer, doing the reverse. Uh, actually, they do exactly this in the paper, find the exact same results. So that's, you know, that's, that's, that, that's not the issue here. Okay, uh, it's actually a pretty good paper that is very understandable. I encourage you to, to read it. It's on the Raj Chetty's webpage. Uh, finally, uh, Le Capital au 21e siècle. What a great book. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I truly believe that, yeah, we, we've learned a lot from, from that. Uh, now, in the context of what I've showed you today, I think... It's, it's, it's a tiny bit less relevant. Why is it? I think what Thomas is essentially interested in is what happens at the very top of the income distribution, the top of the wealth distribution. We know that, you know, the big chunk of the increase in inequality is happening at the very high end of the income distribution. There, we want to take action. Putting in place a wealth tax can reduce the amount of inequality that there, there is at the top of the income distribution. It has non-trivial effect on government resources because now these guys are so rich that, you know, a little change on the tax that you put on them have non-trivial effects on welfare uh, resources that you can spend on the poor. Still, this is not with the tax that you can fund the welfare system. You cannot fund 50% of you know, uh, GDP with a tax on wealth, okay? So I think it's important. It tackles another set of issues, and I think it's extremely, you know, important to, to, to pursue it, uh, this agenda. I don't think it's necessarily going to make a big change to the way we should think about uh, welfare policies at the bottom of the income distribution. Great, thanks. So finally, I would, would like to thank all of you for coming and ask you to join me in thanking our speaker, Camille, one more time. Thank you.